you're here today, would you stand? Let's prepare our hearts for worship this morning. Let's ready our hearts. We're entering God's presence today. He welcomes us in, into his house, amen. So we can bring our shame, we can bring everything that we got today to the, to the foot of the cross. We can lay it all down before him. Let's sing this together. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. My story isn't over, my story's just begun. Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Failure won't define me, cause that's what my father does. If you know, sing it. Ooh. So lay your burdens down, ooh, here in the Father's house. So check your shame at the door, cause it ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's house. We're in the Father's house. We're in His prayer. Arrival's not the end game, the journey's where you are. You never want it perfect, you just want it more. And the story isn't over, if the story isn't good. Failure's never final when the Father's in the room. That's right. And failure's never final when the Father's in the room. Shame at the door, sin ain't welcome anymore. Ooh, you're in the Father's house. We're in the Father's house. We're in His presence today. And things start to change. Things start to change in His presence. Here's what happens. Prodigals come home. The helpless find hope. Oh, love is on the move when the Father's in the room. Amen. The prison doors fling wide. The dead come to life. Oh, love is on the move when the Father's in the room. Miracles, they take place. Miracles take place. The cynical find faith. Oh, love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. The Jericho walls are quaking, strong ones now are shaking. Oh, love is taking through when the Father's in the room. And love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Ooh, lay your burdens down. Ooh, here in the Father's house. So check your shame. We're in the Father's house, the highest King Jesus. He welcomes us, welcomes us in this morning. So we sing together. Who am I that the highest would welcome? I was lost, but he brought me in. His love for me. Oh, his love for me. Oh, the sun sets free. Oh, it's free.
Church, you sound great this morning. What a great song, what a great choir, what great lyrics to sing, to be able to sing the song of God's children together because we're children of Him, right? Um, I, I love that we just sang that part. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. Why? Because I'm a child of God. And earlier on, we sang that we're in God's house, we're in His house. It means we're in Dad's house, right? Um, earlier this week, quickly I'll share. I was talking to a friend about the idea of going back to parents' house. Some of you guys know that I'm originally from South Texas, and my parents still live down there in South Texas, maybe five, six hours away. And uh, even though I haven't been at mom's and dad's house for 10 years plus or something, my room is still there. It's still set up. You know, some of my old stuff is still there. It's kind of weird, to be honest, going back home and going back into my room now as a married man with a, with a son, but my room's still home. And uh, we were talking about the idea that no matter how many miles I've traveled away from, from dad's house, from my parents' house, that I'm always welcome back home, that I can always go back home, and that my parents would always receive me, that there's always a place for me in their house because I'm their children and because they love me, right? And that there's, a, there's an assurance there that I have that no matter how far I go or, or what I've done in my life, that I can always go back to my parents' house. In fact... When I moved to Houston, that was my plan. I was like, well, if all else fails, I'll just go back to mom and dad's house, you know? But, but if we think about that in a spiritual sense, that's what we are. Scripture says that we were once orphans, but because of what Jesus did on the cross, we were adopted into his families, and now we're called children. We're called sons and daughters of the Most High, right? And some of us, even as sons and daughters, we've strayed away. We've gone miles away. We've, we've left home, right? And, and some of us need to come back home. Some of, us, some of us are prodigals that just need to return home. And, and I'll tell you what, shame, shame keeps us from thinking that we can't even go back home. But I want to tell you this truth right now, that the Lord welcomes you back home. That the Lord, that there's always a place for you to come back home. And maybe today's a day. Maybe today's a day. Maybe you feel like you've gone too far, but the Lord wants to welcome you back home. The Lord wants to welcome you and to take you and to love you and to receive you in his arms. And so today we're going to sing this song. It's called Prodigals. And that's the idea of coming back home, right? And so I want you to hear it a few times. Let the Lord work in your life. And the rest of us, we can sing a song of hallelujah. We can sing a song of that child coming back home. Hear this song. You know I had my doubts. 
I thought the fire went out, but the old winds are blowing, blowing again. You know I lost my way, and I'm sure I will again someday. But there's a whisper that's calling, calling again. This is the sound of a child coming home. We go. This is the sound of a child coming home. Hallelujah. This is the song of a welcome prodigal. Hallelujah. I thought I was too far gone, but you always welcome me home. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I'm coming home. I'm coming home. I'm coming home. Thought I was miles away. Help me with your hands. Somehow my vision changed. Cause I know you've been with me, with me all along. It took me a long, long time to finally realize that you never, ever, ever shut the door. Maybe some of you need to hear those words today. Maybe you don't know where to start. So for those who are afraid to come, there is no fear in perfect love. For those who don't know where to start, He always meets us where we are. For those with just a little faith, a little faith is all it takes. He's calling. Oh. Calling. If you got caught up in religion's game, then let him show you the real thing. For the skeptic's still in search of truth, he'll bring that child out of you. So what are you still waiting for? He's standing at an open door and he's calling. Yes, he's calling. Yes, he's calling. This is the sound of a child coming home. Hallelujah. This is the song of a welcome prodigal. But you always welcome me home. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. I'm coming home, coming home, I'm coming home. Amen. That's right. Lord's calling you home today. And speaking of calling you home, uh, why don't you take your seats? I want to tell you over these last few weeks, we've welcomed home some new family members into the family of Christ through baptisms. I just want, to sh I just want you to see this 30 second quick photo slideshow of just a few of the baptisms that have happened here in the life of our church in the last few weeks.
Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome. I'm so grateful that you're a part of this service. And uh, those are actually some people who were baptized over the last several weeks. We're so excited about them. In fact, we baptized this morning in the uh, earlier service. And it's just an evidence of God's uh, work and life uh, in the life of our church. And I'm so um, excited for the people who have um, uh, who publicly pro- profess their faith in Christ and have been baptized. And so, anyway, all of that to say, trying to get it out, right? Uh, all of that to say, if you're thinking about baptism in your own life, if you've been thinking about being baptized, uh, we're planning a day, November the 13th, uh, for a huge baptism celebration. In fact, we've already got some who are already scheduled, and if you've been thinking about that in your life, maybe you'd like to get in on that. Here's how. Uh, Grab a welcome card. It's in a seat back in front of you. Grab a welcome card, fill it out, and there's a place there that says, I'm interested in being baptized, and just check that off. And then at the end of the service, after the service, drop it off at the welcome desk, and then somebody will be in touch with you about what the steps are and what would happen next for you to be baptized on that special day. So, think about that. By the way, if you're new to Bear Creek, welcome. So grateful that you're here. In fact, we'd love to say welcome home, meaning welcome home. This is your church home. We'd love to be uh, your church home. And, and if you have some questions, maybe about our ministry, or if you'd like more info about uh, how we can reach into your life or into the lives of your family, grab also the welcome card and fill it out and drop it off at the welcome desk. And uh, if you do that, by the way, as someone new, we have a, like a wonderful gift, a really great gift. I promise you, I hate those cheesy church gifts. This isn't a cheesy church gift. It's a great gift. And so, uh, so uh, fill it out, drop it off there. We'd be happy to interact with you for a moment uh, as well. Hey, right after this service, something special is happening, something I look forward to. Uh, I, we do this uh, a few times a year. It's called Lunch with the Pastor. And so we provide just a really light lunch um, that happens immediately after this service for anybody who's new to Bear Creek. And the reason we do that is I'd love the opportunity to get to meet you. And so uh, if you'd like to take advantage of that, you'd like to be a part of that, it's brief, it's uh, informal, uh, and so all you have to do is just come to it. Happens in the room next door, just right next door. It's called W103, but it's next door, and uh, just show up for it, and we would love to get to meet you, spend some moments with you, have a, uh, have a light lunch uh, together, and then you can uh, have a wonderful, blessed Astros afternoon, all right? And so uh, it'll be an excellent, uh, excellent day. Well, I want us to um, get to pray together. And this is a moment for us as a church that every time we come to this moment of prayer, we just remind ourselves as a church family, we worship in how we give, and giving is worship, and I just want to invite you to give back to the Lord. And do that out of your devotion to Him and your love for Him, and because you want to worship Him. And so uh, you can grab an envelope in the seat back in front of you, fill that out, and drop it in the giving receptacles. You can use your device, just text the number uh, that you see. But some point this morning, worship the Lord um, in your giving. Why don't we stand together? Let's stand, because I want us to enter, re-enter into God's presence. Let's bow together. Hey, would you just know that there is nothing worth more than being in His presence? So this ought to be a moment for you, no matter the burden that's in your heart right now, no matter the struggle you're going through, no matter the hard thing that's happening, do you know the most healing and the most powerful thing that you could do in the face of that is to welcome His presence into your life. Invite His presence into you. God, we do that now. We bow before you, and we want to lift our hearts and lift our voices, and we want to say to you, Holy Spirit, you are welcome into this place. You're welcome into my life. You're welcome into into the stuff I'm going through, and I just ask you for your power, and I ask you for your encouragement, and I ask you for your comfort, and I ask you for your answer. We open our mouths now. We worship you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's continue in worship through song. Let's invite the Holy Spirit into this place. Let's ask the Lord to give us the awareness that he's here, inhabiting our praises, ready to work in us. Amen. So just soften up your heart. Just give him permission to do his work. Give him permission to do a life-changing work in you, a miracle. Let's sing together. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. Nothing can compare your living home. Your presence is. I've tasted and seen. The sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is
lifted up. That's our prayer today, Lord, that you would overcome us, that you would fill us, Lord, with your spirit, God. Our hearts long for you. Our hearts need you, Lord. Our hearts need a fresh wind of your anointing, Lord. Our hearts need the Holy Spirit. So, God, today we come and we lay everything down. And we open up our hearts, Lord, and we surrender we tear down, Lord, any barrier, any wall that we've set, Lord, and we ask that you would come, Lord, and that you would invade our hearts. It's what we need. It's you that we need, Lord. And so we want to give you full permission. We want to surrender fully to you and, and let you do a miracle changing work in our hearts today, God. So would you do that in Jesus' name today? Would you do that in Jesus' name? Work in our hearts. Speak to us today. And those that would share and come in agreement with that prayer today would say amen in this room. Amen. Amen. It's so great to worship with you, church. You can take your seat. that's called Becoming. And so here's what we've been saying. One of the hardest things in this life is figuring out the difference between what matters most and what only seems to matter. In fact, in fact, it's really important to get, to get that figured out. The challenge is getting that figured out fast enough because you can use up a lot of your life pursuing stuff that don't really matter matter. And so this series, this fall series, we call it Becoming because that is exactly what this series is. It's about. It's about the process of becoming. What matters most is the process of becoming. Becoming what? Becoming who God, becoming what God has created you to be. And so how do you, how do you live a life of that process continually going on? Um, and, and not just pursuing what matters, but what matters most. Because look, look, you, you've got to get it figured out that, that becoming matters way more than accumulating or achieving or accomplishing. And so that's what we're answering in this series. And we're just saying becoming involves a, a focus on your inner life, on your character, 
uh, on the qualities that reside in your heart. That's what matters most, that they grow inside of you and you are becoming who God has created you to be. And sacred scripture speaks into what God has created you to be. And in fact, the Word of God puts it in terms of heart qualities found in uh, Galatians 5. It starts in verse 22. And so this becoming process is represented by fruit growing in your heart, in your inner life, and out of your life. Becoming, just focusing on these nine heart qualities causes you to become. And so we're in the first of those nine qualities right now. We started it last time. And so listen to the Word of God. So the Bible says in Galatians 5, it starts in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. There's our quality that we're working on right now. But it follows, not just love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law, the verse says. Then in verse 24, now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh along with its passions and desires. Verse 25, so if we live, so if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. And so, We declare this is the Word of God, and it speaks in a supernatural way. In other words, in a way that can change our lives. And watch the big idea of this passage. Watch the big idea of this message come out of it. And and here it is. This is what matters most. This matters most. Knowing that you are loved so deeply that it transforms you from the inside out. There's the big idea knowing something, knowing that you are so deeply loved that that love itself begins to transform you. And so, how does that love change you? That's the message we began last time, and it flows into this message. How does that love actually change you? If that matters most, that a certain kind of love should come into my life, and if that love can come into my life, it should transform me How do I live in that? How does it happen? How does it change me? How does it transform me? And we're working on it right now. Let me review a little bit. First of all, we said that the starting point, in fact, it's even before the starting point, the prequel. (laughs) The pre-starting point is you'll probably have to redefine what love is for it to make any difference in your life. For this love, the love that we're describing here in this passage, defined by the word that's there, more than likely, the starting point for you is you're going to have to just redefine what it even uh, is. And so the fruit of the Spirit is love. The word used there in the biblical text is not phileo. It's not just an emotional affection for those you, you love, those who are close around you. It's not the word eros, which means to be like emotionally moved by something. That's not the definition of love. It's not transactional love. It's not uh, attractional love. Rather, it is this, it is, is, it's the love that's described by the word agape, agape. It's the overwhelming way the New Testament communicates love. Almost 250 times when the New Testament says love, it says agape. And so it's a redefinition of what love even is for us. It, it redefined love for the Greek and Roman uh, world in which first century Christians live, uh, and it redefines it for us because, because the word is not primarily an emotion. It's primarily a behavior, this word agape. It's a behavior that flows out of being so loved by God, loved so completely by God, so fully that it deeply affects uh, how you treat every other human soul in your life. It's an act, it's a behavior of self-giving. It's an act, it's a behavior of self-sacrifice for the highest good of another with no dependency on how you're feeling 
about them, about yourself, about the circumstances around you. That's a redefinition of love. I mean, almost none of us uh, in our generational reality now, almost none of us define love, defines love that way. But there's the starting point. And so, and so the question, though, drills down deeper. Uh, how does that love grow as a fruit in your life? How does it grow actually as a fruit in your life? And I want us to really grapple with that, dig into that in this message. And it's two simple, just two really simple principles. But if they get in your life, they change you. And so, and so the first one is this. How does this love grow as a fruit in your life? I'm bleeding over into the last matches, message, into this message. And so how does it grow as a fruit in your life? It is when you first see Jesus loving you. Now, what do I even mean by that? So there's this um, principle in the New Testament that says this is how your life is changed. You ready? The New Testament has this principle that says this is how your life is transformed, is changed. If you embrace Christ, this is how it's changed. I'm going to read it and I'm going to explain it. So it's found in 2 Corinthians 3, it's verse 18, and so the Bible just says, we all, meaning those who know Christ, we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, he means Jesus there, beholding the glory of Jesus, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Now, what does that even mean? It sounds obscure. It sounds like really mystical. But you know what it means? It just simply means this. If you can gaze on the reality of Jesus, if you can gaze on his glory, in other words, what he has made up, if you can look deeply into who he is, that is so powerful, it has such an effect in your life that it actually supernaturally begins to transform you. Beholding Christ in his reality transforms you into the same image of one degree of glory to another. Do you get what that means? It means this, that, that your life can be transformed by the love that he pours into your life if you can just look at it and see it for what it is. The Bible promises there's a transformation that comes with that. And so we say the first principle is this love begins to grow in you as a fruit when you see Jesus loving you. And do you remember how we showed that to one another last time? We said it happened in John 13 on that night, on the precipitating event of that night that Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane to begin to take on the wrath of God for your rebellion, my rebellion, our sin, and then to be betrayed and then tried in kangaroo courts and then beaten and, and tortured and then put on a cross. And it's on that cross that Christ was dying, dying for us, loving us so much that he was giving his life for us so that we could have a pathway, an open door, a way to God, a relationship with God. He was loving us. But John 13 says, John 13 says his love was so deep, so wide, it was, the, it, was to the inf, it was to the infinite degree of love. Having loved his own, he loved them to the end. He loved them to the very limits of what love is. And can you say that or do you have to show that? And so Jesus that night, man, he's just so aware of everything going on around him. Not only that he's deity, but he's, he's fully aware these disciples around him following him, the disciples that are with him, they have nothing to offer him. They don't have anything he needs. And their lives are, oh man, their lives are just a mess. In fact, he already knows that just a half hour, an hour later, all of them are going to hurt him deeply. They're going to abandon him. They're going to run away from him. They're going to tell others they don't know him and they have nothing to do with him. One of them has already made a deal, a bribery deal, to point him out so that he could be arrested and carried away. And Jesus already knows that about them. There's nothing attractional in their lives toward him. They've got nothing that would be good for him if he loved them. 
And so what does he do? He takes a basin and a towel and he gets on his knees and he begins to wash their feet, their first century sandal wearing dirty feet. He doesn't, you know what that, you know what that tells us? He doesn't love attractionally. Listen, the, the most encouraging thing, the most incredible thing is to know that Jesus doesn't love you attractionally. Because you don't have anything to offer him either. I don't have anything in me that would be good for him to have. There is, there is no attractional reason for him to love me in any way at all. And yet, the Bible here is showing us uh, that he loves us with an agape a love. It, it, it ought to be the, the, the most gigantic encouragement in your life because, uh, because it means this. You, even though you can, because you cannot offer him anything, you, you don't have anything he's in need of, that should affect you so deeply because it means so much. It means that, number one, your past will never stop him from loving you. You don't have a bad enough past that would stop him from loving you. All of your past mistakes and rebellions and selfish acts will never stop him from loving you to the limits of love. And that ought to affect you to the deepest part of your core because, because it affects you. That, this should affect your core identity. Our, our identities are formed and they're affected by, by the significant events or or experiences in our life. And maybe a part of your identity has been formed by rejection, by the rejection of somebody important in your life. And he will never reject you. His love, the love he shows us by washing his disciples' feet, the love that he shows us is, uh, is it's not transactional. You can't do anything for me. I'm loving you even though you can't do anything for me. It's not attractional. There's nothing appealing in you at all uh, to me, but uh, I am loving you. Do, you. do you realize for this to change you in any significant way, you've got to see him washing your feet, loving you, because that's who he is. And so the first principle, the first principle is, how does this love start to grow as a fruit in my life? Well, it starts when you can just see him loving you. There are so many, so many millions of people in our culture who name the name of Christ, who say they're Christian, but they live such flat, bland uh, uh, powerless lives. And do you know why? It's because they like Jesus. Do you know why? It's because they respect Jesus. Do you know why? It's because they like a lot of what Jesus has got to say. But you know what? They've never seen him loving them. Like these disciples saw him loving them. And that's how he loves you. If you can see that, if you can just begin seeing that's how he loves you, it'll have the transforming effect of beholding Jesus, seeing him, his glory, and it transforming your inner life. And so it will have an effect, and the effect will be the same effect that I'm, I'm going to talk about a nameless woman in in. Uh, in, in the Gospels that encountered Jesus and His love affected her life in such a deep and powerful way and it's the same effect that, that it should have in your life. And so it's the second principle. How does this kind of love, how does this kind of love grow as a fruit in you? It is not just when you see Him loving you, but it is secondly when you let His love affect your own heart. When you let it in, when you let it in to affect your own heart. Those two principles sound like so elementary and so simple, and they are. But if you let them in, they change you. So I'm going to tell you about the second event. The first event, Jesus loving us, washing his disciples' feet. The second is the effect it can have in our life. It happens several months before this moment in Scripture. In fact, it's recorded in Luke 7. 
rather than reading the long passage, I just, let me just tell you the story. So, months earlier, Jesus is invited to a dinner party in a Pharisee's home during his Galilean ministry, and this Pharisee's name is Simon. And so, dinner parties like that were like hugely important in the culture of Jesus in his day because because only the elite could have them. The poor people never had them. The poor people were never invited to them. And so this was a way to just raise your social capital. And so if you're a really popular person like Jesus was becoming, uh, if someone invites you over to their house and you say, if Jesus says yes, it raises your social capital. Because look, this guy who's preaching to thousands has come to my house to have dinner at my house. But Simon's a Pharisee. The Pharisees hated Jesus. They were so jealous of him. And so he's hoping maybe to do one of two things, raise my own social standing, but, but maybe at dinner, if I can catch him in something, if I, can, if, I can, uh, if I can catch him saying something, make him say something that would be incriminating, well, then it raises my, my status with my, my fellow Pharisees. And so, and so there's a lot of cloak and dagger going on in, at this dinner party. And so he invites, he invites Jesus, and Jesus comes. And these dinners, these dinners were, were community events, only the elite got invited, but the poor people would come. It would be at night, and they would come, and, and these dinners were usually in the rich person's courtyard, and so the poor people could come, and they would stand around the low fence, and they would just watch. They would just see it all happen, and they'd see the fine food brought out, and they'd go, ooh, ah, wow. And the fine, the, the, the fine uh, robes and jewelry that the rich people wore, and they'd go, ooh, ah, wow. And then they'd listen to the rich people's gossip, and they'd go, ooh, ah, wow. And in the midst of this dinner party, a ruin-the-party disaster happens. Somehow, an impoverished woman slipped into the eating area, not outside the wall. She slips into the eating area, and she comes up behind Jesus. Jesus is sitting at the place of honor, the honored guest place. And so they're, uh, the guests, they're on these big pillows, and they're leaning on them, and they're reclining out, and so their feet sort of go back behind them. And she comes up behind Jesus and just crumples on her knees and begins weeping and, and washing, actually washing his feet with her tears. The tears are flowing so heavily that Actually, they're washing his feet, and then she even breaks this bottle of perfume, incredibly costly perfume, and pours it over uh, his feet. In fact, in fact, this is worth reading. Listen, uh, in Luke, Luke 7, 38, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept, kept wiping them with her hair, with the hair of her head, and kissing his feet and anointing them with perfume. Now, it's obvious in the details of the story, the Luke 7 story, that this woman had more than likely been reduced to prostitution. The, the passage says she was a sinner, and Jesus later says about her sin, her sins, which are many. And so she's seen, she's seen as a really sinful person there. It probably means her life had been reduced to prostitution, and, and, and primarily because of the injustices in her society and in, in her generational moment. More than likely, she had lost her husband to death, and had no family who could help her. And in her social setting, she couldn't get a job. She could not uh, actually work. Uh, and, so, and so out of hunger, out of total need, she was forced into selling her body. And so everybody there is indignant that she's there that she's doing what she's doing. They're shocked that Jesus is letting it happen. He's not stopping it. Uh, in fact, Simon the Pharisee is having all kinds of thoughts about Jesus in the moment is what the text tells us, especially that Jesus can't be who he claims to be uh, if he's letting this woman wash his feet. And so, and so Jesus sort of clears the air. I mean, the tension has filled the air. And so Jesus, in order to confront the thoughts, the thoughts that Simon is having and his indignation, 
position and his arrogance, Jesus tells a parable. And he says it directly to him, Simon, I have something to tell you. And he tells this story. And it's about two people who fall into debt. A really hard debt. Now, one debt is like small. It's 50 denarii. The, the other is 500. It's gigantic. It's a, it's a large amount of debt. They both fall into it. The key fact of the story is this. Neither one was able to repay. Big debt guy couldn't repay. Little debt guy could not repay. But the money lender graciously forgives both of them. And Jesus asks, Jesus asks Simon, which one's going to love the money lender more? And he doesn't want to answer. In fact, I'm into Luke 7, 42. He's telling that story, 42, 43. Then, then Simon says, I suppose the one whom he forgave more, he doesn't really want to answer. And he says, to, Jesus said to him, you have judged correctly. Now watch, uh, watch the choreography of this, of this move. Verse 44, turning to the woman, Jesus turns to the woman and he says to Simon, Jesus is looking at the woman, and he's talking to Simon, and he says to Simon, do you see the woman? And the whole point of the story is, no, he does not see this woman. He only sees a reason to pour contempt on some. That's all he sees. And so, Jesus makes him see the woman. Simon, I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. It, it was a common courtesy. Come to a dinner party. Uh, if a servant wasn't there to wash your feet, there would at least be a basin for you to wash your own feet. He didn't even provide that for him. It was no respect for Christ at all there. He says, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, common courtesy, come into someone's house. It's how you showed them in his day uh, that they were welcome. Um, uh, uh, the, the, the man would kiss another man on the cheeks there to say, you're welcome into my home. And he said, you gave me no kiss. But she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not, verse 46, anoint my head with oil, cheap olive oil, poured over the head to soothe all of the effects of the sun to soothe uh, that it, it, it was a gracious thing to do uh, for a guest. Uh, but she, but she has anointed my feet, my feet with perfume. She's broken open this vial of expensive poor perfume and poured it out on my feet. Verse 47, for this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And really what he is saying there is those who, those who think they don't have much to be forgiven by God, those who think they're, they're the 51, 49 percenter, that, you know, 51 percent of my life is better than 49 percent of my life, and so I don't really think I need God's grace, you'll never experience it. And so Jesus, Jesus turns to Simon and he says, look at the woman. And it looks, it seems like he's having difficulty looking at her and so he just points it out. And so for, for that Simon and for the Simon that I am and for the Simons that you are, look at the woman. Look at her tears. Do you see what he drew out? Look at her tears, Simon. This is her gratitude pouring out on him. I mean, What's the point here? The point is, let his love affect your heart. Well, when you can see him loving you, it should have this effect in you. And what will be one of the natural effects be? Uh, it'll be? It'll be gratitude pouring out of your life for his grace and mercy uh, in your life. 
What is the queen of all virtues uh, that social sciences uh, tell us that we can experience, um, you know, in our present generation? It's gratitude. It creates more well-being than anything, and gratitude pours out of her heart because of her response to his love. Something supernatural had entered her heart and made her new from the inside out, and gratitude was just pouring out of her. The effect of seeing Jesus love her. But he also says, Simon, Simons, look at her hair. Simon didn't offer the bowl of the towel to wash Jesus' feet. She loosens her hair, uses her hair as a towel to wash his feet. And this is the humility that his love for her was producing in her. Do you get what humility is? At at its core, it's just self-forgetfulness. She's not, not conscious of herself at all. It's self-forgetfulness. She just pulls her hair down and just begins washing his feet. Do you know how appealing your character becomes when this kind of humility enters your heart? Do you... Do you realize how appealing your character becomes when you're no longer ruled by the thought, what am I getting out of this? Do you know how appealing your character becomes when you're no longer ruled by, how how am I looking in this situation? Do you realize how appealing your character becomes when you're not ruled anymore by the question, is this working to my advantage or not? It's the effect of his love on your heart. Simons, look at her tears, look at her hair, look at her kisses. Look at her kisses. Simon, you gave me no kiss, but she has not stopped kissing my feet, he tells him. This is her pure devotion toward him, pouring out on him. I mean, she has just become so devoted to him as Lord of her life. He's done something so massively supernatural in her life, freed her from all of her bondages that she she cannot help it. She just is kissing over and over and over his feet to show him, I am completely devoted to you. That is the effect uh, that his love will have in your life if you open your heart to it. She knew for the first time that she was loved, unconditionally loved, and she couldn't stop responding to that love. Simon, look at her tears. Look at her hair, look at her kisses. Simons, look at her perfume. Simon, you didn't use the cheap olive oil to anoint my head. She has taken the most expensive thing that a woman in her circumstance could, could, could be this expensive perfume, and she's broken the bottle and just poured it out on my feet. This is her pouring out everything of value to her on him, showing him, worshiping him. Listen, this is what worship is to show and to express you are the most valuable thing in my life. That's what his love will do in you. It'll cause you to center up on him and make him the most valuable thing in your life. She's pouring it out. He has become the greatest value in her life. And so, here's the ultimate application. Here's the point. The parable was directed at the heart of Simon, the Pharisee. He thought he he was at worst, the the little debt guy. Maybe he he owed a little, but but he's wrong. (laughs) The point of the story is every single one of us uh, have uh, owe more than we can pay back. And a lot of us think we're like him too. We, we don't really think I'm hopelessly in debt to God for my past, for the kind of brokenness that resides inside of me. And look, if you can't absorb that you owe God more than you can pay, you're not ever going to be changed. If you can't see that you're too broken to reform your own heart, it, it, you're, you're never, you're never going to fall on your knees and wet his feet with your tears. You're never going to loosen your hair and be vulnerable enough to say, I owe more than I could ever pay. 
You're never going to break the bottle of the most valuable, precious thing in your life and pour it on Jesus. Until you can first see him loving you and then you letting it in your heart to affect you. I'm going to ask us to bow together. And for a moment or two, we're just going to respond out of our hearts to how much we are loved. And so as you bow, I want you to ask the question, how do I let his love in my heart? How do I do that? And there are two answers. First is if you're a person who's never placed your faith in Christ, the way you let his love in is to turn to him and what he's done on the cross for you and to invite him to be the leader of your life, the Lord of your life. That can happen right this moment in prayer for you to say to him, Lord Jesus, I ask for what you've done on the cross to count in my life. I take it into my life. Would you, what does that mean? You're asking, Lord Jesus, would you forgive me of all of my sin and bring your life into me and make me brand new? For all of Christianity, that experience is called the new birth. It means his life supernaturally comes into you and is implanted. And for the very first moment, the fruit can begin to grow in you. Ask Christ into your life right now. Surrender to him as Lord and leader of your life. Commit your way to follow him. And you can do that by prayer. Look, pray like this. Just pray with me. Pray, just silently pray. Dear, dear Lord Jesus, come into my life. Become my Lord and my Savior. Please forgive me of all of my sin and give me eternal life. I trust you. I believe you're doing that. I turn my life to you. God gives such a promise in Scripture that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's you in this moment if you've just prayed that. Hey, Christ follower for you, you know this is about you resetting. It's resetting your loves because of time, because of pressure, because of all the stuff in your life. Your loves have gotten disordered and your loving accomplishment more than your loving Christ. Your loving accumulation more than your loving Christ. You're loving the toys and the, and the pleasures that come with it more than your loving Christ, and you're feeling empty. Reset. Turn to Christ. See Him loving you. And then open your heart to its effect. Let it affect your heart. Father, I thank you for these moments. I thank you that we're in your presence. I thank you for what you have done in people's lives all this morning in these services. You're so powerful. You're so good. You've done so many incredible things. And we love you and we praise you and we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.